and injuries of Fortunato, I had borne as best I could. But when she ventured upon insult, I vow revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in her face, and she did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of her immolation. She had a weak point, Miss Fortunato, although in other regards she was a woman to be respected and even feared. She prided herself on her connoisseurship in wine. In painting and in gemmary, Fortunato, like her countrymen, was a quack, but in the matter of old wines, she was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from her materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. <coughs> it was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. She had been drinking much. I was so pleased to see her, I thought I should never have done wringing her head. My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How well you are looking today. But I have received a cask of what passes for an amontillado, and I have my doubts. Uh, how? Amontillado? A cask? <laughs> Impossible! And in the middle of a carnival? I have my doubts. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without first consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. <laughs> Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? <laughs> and I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. <laughs> Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado <laughs> from Sherry. And yet some fools who have it that his case is a match for your own. <laughs> Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. There's Lucchese. <laughs> I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. The walls are encrusted with nitre. <laughs> Let us go, nevertheless. <laughs> Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry. Amontillado! There were no attendants at home. I had told them I should not be home till morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two torches, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed her through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting her to be cautious as she followed. <laughs> we came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady and the bells on her cap jingled as she strode. <laughs> the cask? It is farther on. But I'm sir. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> it is nothing. Come, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as I was once. For me, it is no matter. You will be ill and I do not be responsible. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. <laughs> true, true, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. Drink! Oh! <laughs> Come, we will go back, ere it is too late. You're hot. 
That's nothing. Let us proceed to the Amontillado. But first, another draft of the medic. <laughs> I broke and reached her a flagon of the grave. She emptied it out of breath. She laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at her in surprise. She repeated the movement, a grotesque one. <laughs> you do not comprehend. Not I. Then you are not one of the Masons. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you? A Mason? It's everything fine. Impossible. A Mason. Aside. It is this. <laughs> a very good joke indeed. But let us continue to leave the other. Be it so. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. The bones had been thrown down and laid promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, we perceived a still interior recess. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use in itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs. It was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. Proceed, herein lies the Amontillado. <coughs> As for Lucchese, <laughs> T is an ignoramus. <laughs> In an instant, she had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding her progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered her to the granite. It was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. She was much too astounded to resist. <laughs> the Amontillado? True, the Amontillado. I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of my masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication was a low, low cry from the depth of the recess. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth. And then? There was the clanking of the chains. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed my travel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tiers. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting from the throat of the chain form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a moment, I hesitated, I trembled. But the thought of an instant reassured me. I reproached the wall. I replied to the yells of she who clamored. I re echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tiers. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now, there came forth from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, uh, uh, A very good joke indeed! An excellent jest! You'll have many a rich laugh about at the Palazzo! Uh, Omar Wine! The Amontillado? Uh, yes! The Amontillado! Uh, but is it not getting late? Will I not be awaiting us at the Palazzo? Let us be gone. Yes. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes, for the love of God! But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! <coughs> Fortunato! There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. And I hastened to make an end of my labors. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. And for the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. Impake repuscat, 